Hi, I'm Scott Hamilton, Rock File, back with another podcast review, a continuation of my 007 reviews. We are up to Goldfinger. Well, I gotta say, this is where it all came together. The third movie. I absolutely love this movie, and rewatching it, revisiting it in modern times, it still is the tent pole by the ones that, you know, every other Bond movie that came after this is judged by this one, and probably so, and that's why they went even bigger on Thunderball, which I'll watch soon in review, but... Goldfinger came out in 1964. They filmed it in January to July and released it in September. Can you imagine in modern times a movie being finished in July and released in September? Finally came to the U.S. around Christmas that year and was a huge success. Like the first movie had a budget of $1 million. The second movie had a budget of $2 million. This had a budget of $3 million and went on to gross about $125 million. And that's, you know compare that to what today, that's a huge, huge, huge uh, payback on an investment. So Goldfinger, third installment, James Bond, Sean Connery fits the role like a glove at this point. I absolutely loved everything about this movie. It's it, the tongue-in-cheek humor, they doubled down on it. This He really started with the one-liners and the jokes in this one. Um, this was uh, the first one to have that big opening sequence that didn't really have anything to do with the movie that had beautiful girls and film scenes shown on the bodies and things like that they had messed around with some big openings on the first two but this is where they kind of nailed down this we're going to have these grandiose beginnings that really don't you know other than showing a couple scenes that may happen later in the movie they don't really have anything to do with the movie they're just artistic songs to lead you into it and that was that was this was the first of that kind um it's funny still if you watch a, a, a current Bond movie, that the little circle after he shoots at the very, very beginning in the logo, the white circle bounces around on the screen, then goes down into the right corner and then opens up into the scene that opens the movie. But the first three movies, they didn't have that technology. They couldn't superimpose it. So the little white dot bounces around the screen and then gets smaller and smaller and smaller and disappears. And then it opens the scene. But I got to say, they open with a mid... He's in mid adventure solving a case that became a staple of the james bond movies that we just open on he's finishing up a case so there's a big chase scene and then that will lead into the credits that will lead into the actual movie um they repeated this almost in every single movie after that it's just a great way to get into a franchise film like here's the continuing adventures of 007 and he he completes this big mission and he gets away and it fades into the you know and it's just it's a very romantic very grandiose way to open these movies and and what a great Great job. Early on, they introduced Gert Fo- Frobe, the guy who's playing Goldfinger, Auric Goldfinger. And what a great actor. Um, he embodies this, this villain with, you would almost believe this guy was a real person at the time. Uh, in a lot of Bond movies, the villains are very over the top and very cartoony almost. But this was a guy that, you know, he's got a lot of money and he knows it and he knows what he can do with it. And and he basically, you know, walks through life. And Bond, early on, like, has to fly to Miami to to check him out. They, they want to investigate him. And he finds that he's cheating in cards when he first gets to the nice Miami hotel. And he foils that plan. And he continues to be the fly in Goldfinger's ointment until Goldfinger finally gets tired of it. And we know all about the laser scene that eventually happens. Um but watching it in 2020, I'm like, guys, you know, there's some guys in government that look <laughs> that kind of like Goldfinger does. And and that Sean Connery's 007 always comes back with a, a quip, a joke in this one. And, and it just, you know, it, it won't bother him. It, he's unflappable. You know, Goldfinger's just like, yes, Mr. Mon-. Like that, the, the laser scene I talked about before, and we're talking about a movie from 1964, so there may be spoilers. But, you know, Bond says, do you expect me to talk? No, Mr. Bond, I expect you to die. You know, and it's just like, it, it, he was pitch perfect in the role he, and, and kind of set the tone because Blofeld in the last movie, we didn't even really see. We saw him petting the cat. And we don't know much about Blofeld and they didn't really talk about Spectre and all that kind of stuff in Goldfinger. Goldfinger was pretty much about Goldfinger. And if you haven't seen the movie, I'm shocked, but the 
big story, as we talked about in the last movie, 007 movies grew to have one big story and then lots of little stories happen in them where he meets different characters and weird little things happen or an adventure or a comedy bit or whatever. And then those kind of make up the what happens in between him trying to solve the case and, and find the murder or whatever. Um and, of course, that happens in this movie. He meets some interesting characters along the way. And at the beginning, they're like, co-starring Honor Blackman as Pussy Galore. And it's like, she doesn't show up till halfway through the movie. She, literally 55 minutes into the movie, she's Auric Goldfinger's pilot. Now, granted, she's in most of the scenes throughout the rest of the movie, or a lot of them. And she's a very strong female character. But it's just interesting that, you know, Pussy Galore doesn't even show up till halfway through the movie. And you got to love the names. All taken from the books, by the way, for the most part. Um... But the franchise, um, a lot of better reviewers than I have said, this is where everything came into focus. And watching them in sequence in high definition now, um, yeah, I could totally agree. Goldfinger is where it all came together. They had Dr. No as a template, and they kind of figured out some things. They added some things in From Russia With Love. And they freaking nailed it in Goldfinger. The movie is well-paced. There are some great set pieces, some amazing action scenes. This was the first movie directed by Guy Hamilton, and he directed four or three more. Um, and you can tell the movie is paced better, the action is filmed better, the shots, everything. It's just a better film. Matter of fact, it is on the BFI's Top 100 British Films of All Time in 1999. It was ranked at number 70. Not bad for a, you know, basically B-movie spy caper. Um, running time is a little under two hours. Um, I have been watching these movies on my 2012 007 box set, and I read that all of those Blu-rays were taken from 4K Masters, which is interesting because really only the Daniel Craig movies have been released in 4K on disc so far. But I was talking about this with my roommate last night, and he owns all the James Bond movies, and I said, I'm re-watching all these movies. If there's ever one you want to re-watch, let me know. Um, I'll include you because I've been watching him kind of on my own when he's not around. And and I said, and I'm up to Goldfinger, which is a good one. So if you want, he's like, I would watch Goldfinger tonight. So um, instead of pulling out the disc, which I did test, and I'll talk about that, um, he bought all the movies on Apple TV, and Goldfinger was in 4K. All right, so we watched it in 4K. And I got to be honest, I don't think it looks any different than the Blu-ray. I put in the Blu-ray later, and maybe some of the colors are a little more refined. A little, There's a deeper uh, HDR implementation was pretty uh, realistically handled and not colors aren't blown out or anything like on some of the older movies you get. Um, but really, up converted to 4K from the 4K Master, the Blu-ray looked just as good. There was a, a light sheen of grain on the movie. It's a 1964 movie for crying out loud. It was filmed on film. There will be film grain. Um, and I'm glad they didn't take it out with DNR because that removes details. But it, it looks great. It's the best of the three movies so far, looking-wise, through the whole film. I thought Dr. No looked great. I thought From Russia With Love looked great about 90% of the time, but there were 5 to 10% of shots that were soft, super grainy, or just didn't look like they belonged in the film. Maybe they were elements that uh, you know they had to include that hadn't been scanned for. I don't know. But the, uh, From Russia With Love had several scenes that just looked, wow, this doesn't even look like it's from the same Blu-ray. But like I said, watched it on Apple TV in 4K. The movie looked great, but then popped in the Blu-ray from a 4K master, and it looked just about the same. Maybe a hair tighter, but that was about it. And streaming compared to disc, you know, take that all with a grain of salt. We'll have to wait until the James Bond movies get released in 4K eventually, which they will. We know they will. So anyway, Goldfinger wraps up with him trying to not steal all the gold in Fort Knox. He wants to irradiate it. <laughs> irradiate it. He wants to explode an, uh, an atomic weapon so that nobody can use the gold for, what, 58 years is what they come up with in the movie. And it's, that's actually a pretty good plan because you're not going to be able to steal, you know, tons of gold out of Fort Knox in any quick, easy fashion, especially with all the army bases and, and military bases around it. Um, and, of course, he's got a plan, poison gas, and all that kind of stuff. But the, the set piece in Fort Knox itself, I, w I was talking to my roommate last night that when I was a kid, I thought they really filmed it in Fort Knox. I mean, it, it <laughs> the, the sets have always been great. In, but you just imagine that this was the, the, the depository, you know, for all of this gold. But now that I'm 
how old I am and know how banks and stuff work. No, they wouldn't have made a Fort Knox that looks like this on the inside, nor would they have shown it in a movie. But at the time, I thought, wow, Fort Knox is really cool. It's got multiple levels and a lot of glass and marble and steel. And uh, it made for a great showpiece for him to finally have a fight scene with Odd Job, the henchman, which is another thing that they nailed in the movie. They, they, added the henchman, especially in From Russia With Love with Robert Shaw's character. And so that becomes a thing where henchmen are a big part of the Bond. You know, there's a henchman between the big bad and Bond, usually. Um, and that was Jaws and like the Spy Who Loved Me and the Moonraker movies. And, and but, but some of the movies have gone away from that idea as well. But I do like that there is not just the foil of the big bad guy, but there's also a foil in somebody who might be just as talented as James Bond as far as the action goes and stuff like that. And, and odd job. I mean, Bond tries to fight him at the end and punches don't affect him. He hits him with steel bars and it doesn't bother him. He finally has to electrocute the guy. But anyway, um, what I liked most, Sean Connery's portrayal, he just feels very comfortable in the role. And like I said, the tongue-in-cheek humor, oh, wow. The, the difference between the first two movies and this one, there were a couple lines here and there. But this one, every comeback is something, oh, man, that was pretty funny. Oh, <laughs> that wouldn't fly today, but that was pretty funny back then. Uh, there's one scene where he, uh, Dink, the little girl that he's with in the beginning, he pat, who's giving him a massage, he's a masseuse at the Miami Hotel, he pats on the butt and says, it's time for, for man talk, and pats her on the butt and tells her to go away because she's a woman. And That would not play well today, but we all know, well, it's because they were going to do dark and evil things. He's a secret agent, and that's why. But in the, in the movie, it plays out like, wow, that wouldn't go over too well in 2020, but it's still funny. And the whole thing, plays like a, a a time capsule of that time, the cars. Talking about Guy Hamilton's directing, he was a very good director. He directed quite a few very famous movies. You can look him up. I've always remembered the name because I'm Scott Hamilton. And, and when there's a famous person that has your name, you just always kind of gravitate towards their articles and their movies or whatever. Um, so I, I've always kept up with kind of Guy Hamilton, even though I don't think we're related anywhere, probably way back in Scotland or something. Um, but anyway... He's directed a lot of great movies, and you could just tell with this movie, they do a lot of shots. Today we would do with drones, but they had to do them with helicopters and planes back in the day. Overhead shots of Fort Knox or some of the places they were. This was the Bond movie that really doubled down on going to multiple foreign locales. Uh, in front Russia with Love, they spent a lot of the time in Istanbul, but this, they hit a couple of places, you know, and as the movies go on, they hit more and more and more. They shot the movie in the UK, Switzerland, and the United States back in January to July of 64, and the movie holds up. I mean, obviously, it's not going to be a, a Fast and Furious or a Hobbs and Shaw of today, but... It is a quintessential Bond movie, and anybody who watches it gets the whole schwack load of Bondisms. The car. This was the first time he had a car that had all the gadgets. You know, we talked about in the last podcast that Q, um, Llewellyn, who got the role, only got it by luck for the second movie. And in the third movie, they made him a full-blown character. He's Q, head of the Q branch, and... Uh, 007, stick with me for about an hour, and I'll show you all the things that this car can do. Here's the machine guns, and here's the ejector seats, and here's, the, you know. And in the first two movies, they gave him a couple weapons, and they gave him a radio and that kind of stuff. And a, a, But this was the, track, the two tracking devices, and the car, and the weapons, and the ejector seat, and it, it, the high technology. Some of the things, obviously, fantasy at the time, but they pull it off. He's got big chase scenes through a warehouse district, and he ejects a guy out the top, shoots oil out of the back, machine guns out of the front, uh, bulletproof window, bulletproof glass. It's just they nailed so many parts of the James Bond trappings in this movie. Everything they did in the first two movies came together. All the stuff they added is just quintessential Bond. Goldfinger, it's one of the best ones. If you only own a few James Bond movies, this is one of them, and I can't recommend it more. Looks great on Blu-ray, looks great on a 4K stream, hoping for a 4K disc release at some point, but 
Goldfinger with that big title song by Shirley Bassey and all the women painted in gold and all that stuff. You have to watch Goldfinger if you haven't. It's quintessential Bond. Enjoy it. I'm Scott Hamilton. Sorry I babbled so long, but I love Bond and I finally got to the ones that make me go, this is why I love James Bond. The first two movies are good, but this is it. This is this is the whole package in two hours. Absolutely love Goldfinger. Rockfile or therockfile.com is my website. You can hashtag Rockfile, find all of my other projects. Please share, please subscribe, and thank you so much for listening. We've got more Bond and other podcasts coming up.